Excuse me, just a second. If you will take your Bibles and turn to Ephesians chapter 5. Pastor Kevin has been making his way through the book of Ephesians. What I decided to do tonight um, is to go back and, and pull out a section of Ephesians chapter 5 and kind of turn it into something I think will be helpful for us tonight. You've got a sheet of paper there. Um, a lot of you, I guess I put some out on the, in the vestibule. Uh, if you didn't get one, we want to make sure you got one. Anybody need one, we can send a runner. Everybody got it if you want it? Okay. All right, good enough. Uh, so Ephesians chapter 5, we're going to pull out verses 15 and 17. We will get to that in just a minute. This time of year is always an interesting time of year because you start looking back, don't you? You start kind of reconsidering all that has happened uh, in 2023, as well we should, you know, because it's a learning lesson for a lot of things. Um, and a lot of times, you know, it's kind of interesting to, my wife likes to watch the thing there at the very end where they go back and do the year in review, you know, and kind of see the, all the, uh, you know, the events of the year and, and uh, kind of roll those over again. A lot of things we would like to forget uh, about 23, as most years, there are some things we want to forget. Um, but all, all the magazines and things that you'll see, we'll, we'll kind of go back and look at the big events for the year. Um, and and it's, it's interesting that, uh, you know, over the years people have made predictions about things that would happen, and sometimes they're actually pretty accurate. Some going back 10 and even 20 years, um, and uh, it, that they would guess of things that would happen in the future. It's interesting, I came across um, one such prediction that was given in 1967. Um, experts predicted that by the turn of the century, uh, technology would have taken over so much, you'll get a kick out of this, um, so they have, would have taken over so much of our work that we do that the average American work week will only be 22 hours and that we would only have to work 27 weeks a year. This is what the prediction was. As a result, he went on to say, one of our biggest problems would be in deciding what to do with all of our leisure time. Um, I, I guess somebody set him straight later on as to what happens when you get efficient, right? When you get efficient, you get more work. <laughs> you know, that's kind of how things go. So that didn't happen exactly. But anyway, um, most of us you know, seem to be very busy. We're always in a hurry. We, we walk fast. We talk fast. We eat fast. Um, and, you know, sometimes we, we eat fast. And then as we're finishing that last bite, we jump up and say, okay, got to go and jump to the next thing. So here we are in the last week of 2023. Uh, I wonder how we will do this next year. Um, will we be as busy? Will we make any better use of our time? In 365 days, when this year is over, when we look back as we're doing tonight, will we do so with joy about some things that happened, or will we look back with regret? Will we be looking at the future with anticipation, or will we be looking at that future with dread of things to come? I don't know. Um, well, here's this passage of Scripture that I think can help us to look forward and actually makes some predictions about the year 2024. Y'all think I'm crazy, don't you? It actually does. Look at verses 15 to 17. Let's read those together, and then we're going to break those down and exegete some thoughts from the passage. So here we go, verses 15 to 17. Look carefully, then, how you walk, not as unwise, but as wise making the best use of the time, because the days are evil. Therefore, do not be foolish, but understand what the will of the Lord is. Um, just off the cuff, have you ever taken a step that you shouldn't have taken, that got you in trouble somehow? Um, it's kind of interesting. We talked a little bit about this this morning. I'll be curious to see what some of you speak up tonight. A step that you shouldn't have taken that got you in trouble somehow. I'll tell you, I'll start it off. A few years ago, um, Susan and I took, uh, it's been a long time ago, I guess now, we took a youth group to a camp up in the, in the North Carolina mountains. And uh, so we were watching over them. Of course, we had some time to ourselves, and she had gallivanted up onto one of the hills. Now you're not supposed to be up there at certain times, and she did it anyway. She's a bad influence, just like Eve was. If 
following suit. But anyway, here's my wife goes up on the hill. She comes back and says, look, there's this cool obstacle course up on the hill. How about come down there, come up there with me, and I'm going to show you, you know, we'll walk through it together. So we did. So I'm going up there, you know, and, and I'm Mr. Athletic, and here's my wife going to show me an obstacle course. But anyway, so one of the things that you had to do in this obstacle course is they had this giant log that, oh man, it, it must have been this big around, that was suspended. It was probably, I don't know, 30 feet-ish long, and it was suspended by giant ropes or chains or something between these other two trees. Well, it sat pretty still due to its weight, but the object was for you to walk from one side to the other, which it's so heavy it just barely moved. I mean, it didn't really seem like much of anything. So Susan goes up there, and she just shows me how to do it and walks right across, and I'm like, God. And then what is this? So I just start across there, and to this day, I could not tell you what happened. All I know is when I planted my right foot, I heard it break. And I, I still to this day do not know the movement of the log or my bad balance or unathleticism. Whatever it was at that moment, my ankle broke, and I fell off the log on the ground, writhing in pain. And Susan has to go off the hill to tell them we were trespassing and come get my husband, please. <laughs> so I took this step I wasn't supposed to take and then ended up, you know, uh, spending, I had to finish out camp and, and uh, get it taken care of when I got back to town a few I days later. Oh, yeah. That's right. You had to drive home, didn't you? So uh, anyway, because I, I couldn't, couldn't push the uh, gas pedal. Anyway, that's my story about a bad step I took. Anybody got a good story about a bad step you took that got you in trouble? Come on, somebody, somebody tell us a good story. I'm seeing a bunch of smiles. Somebody tell us. Like a, a snake or a spider or a dog bite or something. What? <laughs> I didn't mean that kind of step. I mean, I mean a literal step. <laughs> oh, that's, that's, yeah, that's, uh, <clears throat> I should have qualified this a little more. I mean, a literal, physical footstep type of thing. That's, yeah, that's it. Oh, okay. Oh man, uh, we heard I heard some stories this morning about uh, people stepping on uh, on snakes, and my wife brought in two brown recluse the other day in a box. Uh, she was starting to get Christmas put up. Evidently, you guys have a lot of brown recluse around here, um, and so I, I did verify with the folks this morning. They said, "Yeah, I'm sure, that's what they were. They love cardboard boxes." So um, anyway, uh, so beware of the next step is the idea. Well, this passage basically says for us, beware of the next step of life. But as we make the predictions from this passage, I want to break it down in just three simple thoughts, easy to follow. Let me give you the first one of these tonight. Number one, you will have a choice how you will live in 2024. Isn't that deep? Well, it's, it's straight out of Scripture, so evidently it needed to be pretty simple for us. Look carefully how you walk. Look carefully, not as unwise, but as wise. Now, being admonished to look carefully, I mean, why would Paul say that? Um, evidently, he noticed some things in the Ephesian church that needed correction, that needed to be brought to the surface. So he tells the Ephesian church, hey, I don't know what this behavior is that we, we, we still don't really know, but it must have called for a warning back at that time. Uh, and I think warnings still ring true for us today. Uh, we need warnings time to time, and I'm glad we have Scripture for that reason. Because I'm afraid that many days pass in our lives without a single thought for eternity or consequences. You know, you can go on YouTube these days and you can see all the videos you want of people making bad decisions while they're being filmed, <laughs> right? You know, you ought not to try that. Oh, wow. Um, anybody ever done that? You just kind of leapt forward in life and made a decision that brought on some type of a bad consequence. Man, I'm, I'm raising my hand with you. I think we all have. And sometimes we do that. Well, Paul, and, and under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, says, hold on. <laughs> uh, take time to look carefully how you walk. Because you've got the choice. I realize that tonight we are in a free will Baptist church. 
uh, and we do have a free will. No other time of year brings this to the surface, in my opinion, than this time of year. In a few days, we will come upon New Year's Eve. Oh, my gracious. Um, and what do you think is going to happen on New Year's Eve? Uh, Justin quit smiling so big. I, I read an article. I read an article called, um, this is, I'm being serious. It was called, Why Do People Go Nuts on New Year's Eve? That was the name of the article. And it was actually from New, uh, U.S. News and World Report several years ago. And it was quite interesting, especially since it was coming from a secular viewpoint. It made it even more intriguing. The author said that she decided to embrace New Year's Eve for once and see what happened. You know, I, mean, I think we know the rest of the story. She got more than she bargained for. Uh, the article pretty, title pretty much explains her thoughts afterward. And a quote from this article, this is what she said. Everything in moderation, I always say, says, oh, get, catch her name, J. Buzz Von Ornsteiner. That's her name. Great name. Oh, and guess what her job was? The psychologist and project director for the Mental Health Court Advocacy Program in New York. It just all fits together, doesn't it? Oh, bless her heart. Anyway, um, so here's what she says. Excess indicates that the individual has lost control and is powerless over what he or she craves. However, many individuals tell me that they store up their stress and anxiety and then on New Year's Eve use that bottled up stress as an excuse or rationalization to get drunk, take drugs, have multiple sexual contacts, or overeat. Since it's once a year and somewhat culturally accepted. It almost makes me mad reading it, but she's right. She's dead on. In addition, this is what she says, in some circles, it's often encouraged. Bad behavior. Hey, this is the time of year. We just live it up and, you know, hey, get your indulgences later, right? You know, we, can, we can worry about the consequences later. Um, craziness. Um, you know, if you, you ever watch, you know, Times Square, y'all watch this when they do the big ball drop and everything, and you see the people just crammed in there like this. And people do this intentionally. Y'all know, I've read a little bit more about this whole thing at Times Square, and they say once you're in there, you're in there for the whole time. And that people know this, and, and from, you know, times past, people will actually, that don't normally wear them, will wear adult diapers, so that they can just not have to leave while they're there the whole time. True story. You can look it up. People actually do that. But, hey, let's just indulge ourselves in whatever is going on and get crazy for the night, right? But the Bible says, hold on, that, that doesn't sound like a very wise decision. For the reason that within just a few minutes, you can drag your name through the mud you can drag the name of Christ through the mud. And I suppose, you know, we'd be better to heed the admonition of Scripture um, than, than giving a people a, a reason to doubt the God that we serve or a misunderstand who He is because of our lifestyle. We've got to be determined to set an example. Um, and, you know, again, I know that we are a free will Baptist church, a church, but this point makes it clear um, that you're free to live as you, sh you want to, but there's an old saying that actually says, it's a spinoff of a Bible verse that says this, just because you can doesn't mean you should, right? And, uh, you know, this would be where the old saying, hold my beer comes in and people make lots of bad decisions at that moment, right? The Bible actually says in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 23, and this is where it comes from. All things are lawful, but not all things are helpful. All things are lawful, but not all things build up. I mean, these are the, these are the words of the same author of our text. Now, it's, it's penned over in the book of 1 Corinthians, but it's the same author, Paul. 
And the first the, the, the church, Corinthian church was notorious for their, their bad behavior. So here he was warning them to not let their free will lead them into sinful behaviors. So let's just sum this first point. And it's pretty elementary. It's, it's face value kind of thing. Be determined this year to live like a Christian more than you did in 23. It is your choice. You will have a choice. Let's look at a second thing here tonight. Number two, time will get away from you. I apologize for having a swig water tonight, <clears throat> but I've been fighting this voice thing. Time will get away from you. Hey, let's just do a time out here for just a second. What is the furthest back memory that you have? Let's, let's see who can go back the furthest in the life when you were little, little. What's the first memory you think you can go back to? Way, way, way back. Vivid memory. Think on it just for a second. Got some really good ones this morning with the crowd. What are they? Somebody, somebody tell us your first, the further you think it's the furthest back memory you have. I was two. Really? What was it? My brother and Bart were in a cigarette line. Oh, goodness. Uh, you know, for some reason, you still got the scar. <laughs> He's pointing at the scar. <laughs> His bro brother burned him with a cigarette lighter when he was two. Yeah, yeah, I would imagine. A lot of times surrounding pain are memories that you do have. What's some other memories? What you got? It's about one and a half, two-ish. And I actually didn't know this was it at the time. I just had a memory of it. And I asked my mom, does this sound familiar to you? <clears throat> I started giving her this layout of this room, TV over here, couch here, yada, yada, walking around the hallway, basically where the, you, know, you walk from the kitchen to the living room. And she said, here at your mammy's house. And uh, she passed away when I was, whenever I was super young. So I think I was maybe two or three at the time when she passed away. So. But you can still see uh, that in your I mind. Painted everything. Wow. Wow. Uh, I also was not quite two. I was about 20 months. And I vividly remember my, my mother carrying me on her hip. We walked into my aunt's house. We had moved from uh, Arkansas to Virginia. And so we walked into my aunt's house, and I can see her dining room table sitting on the left whenever we walked in. Like, I don't know what it is, but I can I can see her house in my head to this day. It's always, I was on my mom's hip. <laughs> like and you remember that part, too. Uh, I remember the, um, when Brother Wilford was here. And I don't, I, I don't know how old I was when they were packing up to leave, but we were helping them. I was probably like three, two or three. And I remember a snow globe that they, that they had in their room, what, you know, the little girl did. And then I remember Miss Donna Schaefer's house, and she used to babysit me. And I described it to her, her daughter one day on the phone. And I said, does this still look like, but she said, it still looks identical to that. I said, how do you remember all that? I was like, I don't know. I don't know why <laughs> things get imprinted on your mind. Well, what, what's, what's another interesting memory you guys can remember way back? Oh, goodness. Me and the boy Michael, we was out playing around. I remember I hit my head up against one of the things. Pain, again, pain is, is a lot of times associated with memories. Uh, I got a little pain. He bloodied my lip one time when I was a little kid. Mom <laughs> <laughs> did. I remember we used to be in the old rock church, and we have to trot out to the back of the outhouse where his kids. Oh, we had an outhouse? Yes, we did. Oh, wow. Up to what year was that? Do you remember? No, I was... Well, don't look at me. I wasn't alive. <laughs> <laughs> well, we, when we built that other art farm, we didn't have one until we built it in 1975. Not wow. Many, hey, not as many people got up here in church to build the bathroom. <laughs> I, I guess not. But they had, we had no more cranky windows. We cranked them out, and then there was like... There was some stones on the side of this side of the farm, but I was little then. 
My I goodness. The nursery, the nursery in the hallway there, they used to have the wall, they have the whole floor to wall um, cribs, and you I guess they put the baby in, they put the pull the little crib thing down and snap the things, and the baby is like in a cage. We had in our nursery. Yeah, those used to be popular years ago in churches. Cage up the babies, keep them safe. Yeah. What's the oldest memory you got, Brother Lawton? Well, don't get me started. Come on. I want to hear one. We're going to quit tonight. I want to hear a good one. I did one that it was a good one, and, and I was, uh, let me see. It was in 1950, so I was nine years old. But I know, I, my memories are in there. But we had moved into the, the rock building church up here. And uh, Patsy Kincaid was pianist. All of those things. She was playing away, and, and a big black snake <laughs> ran out of the piano. <laughs> well, that just that was like the Missy Squirrel. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> it was a big deal. Well, we had the snake killing. You know, the older guys did. I didn't have anything to do with it. I, I was a kid. I was there. And so we got all settled down and got started, and everything leveled out. She started playing in the second one. <laughs> oh my goodness. <laughs> long, long <laughs> uh, something you wouldn't forget. No, I guess not. And we'll be watching over here now to see. Um, you know, how how vividly do you remember that? How how vividly do you remember that? Oh, I can just see it. Just uh, you just saw it in your head again, didn't you? Can, can, I, can I make us our second statement again tonight? Time will get away from you. Can you believe it's been however long that's been? You said you were nine, and you're 107. How old are you now? So, well, I'm 82. So can you believe that much time has passed already? Um, you know, I mean, I think any adult would say that same thing. I, I remember just a few years ago thinking... I mean, I really remember thinking this. Anybody over 40 is ancient. That is just, that's just unbelievable. People don't, you know, that just seems so weird to even think that one day I might be that age, you know. And now, I mean, that's, that's youngin'. That is a youngin'. Is Billy Faye back there? Does she remember that? She's in a nursery. Oh, I bet. I bet we'll have to ask. Um, man. Time gets away from you. And that second verse in our passage tonight, making the best use of the time, because the days are evil. I, I guess he meant it when he said it back then, but would anybody reiterate what he said about the days being evil? You know, it just seems like all the time we just kind of shake our head and go, how in the world can things get any worse than they are right now? But time gets away from us. Paul tells us here we got to make the best use of our time. Um, one translation actually says, make the most of every opportunity. You've heard that said. There's a couple other verses I think I put on your handout here tonight. Um, Psalm 39, 4 says, Show me, O Lord, my life's end and the number of my days. Let me know how fleeting is my life. And then again, he said, the length of our days is 70 or 80 years. If we have the strength, they quickly pass and we fly away. Man, isn't that true? Um, a few years ago, um, I remember a, a People magazine published an article. This is the name of it, Dead Ahead. I thought it was interesting. And it was telling about a clock that kept track of how much time you have left to live. Does anybody ever remember that? I remember it. And <laughs> dead alive. And uh, here, I mean, so what you did, it calculated the average lifespan of 75 years for men and 80 years for women, you know, because that's supposedly fact. 
So you program in your sex and your age into the clock, and from then on, it will tell you how much time you have left. And you can have it for a cool $99.95. Get you a Benjamin, and you can have a clock that will tell you when you're going to die. Um, I didn't buy one, but it was, it was an intriguing idea, actually, you know, to think about that. Um, so I kind of noodle around a little bit more on the Internet to find out how you calculate that thing. Um, and I actually, if I live to 75 years, I calculated my days left. This has been a couple years ago I did it. So at that point, it was, it was 10,735 days is the days I had left to live, if I made it that long. But there's a big problem with the calculation of time ahead, right? There's a scriptural problem with that. Some of y'all are shaking your head at me. What's the problem with that? What does the Bible say about days ahead? Just somebody say it out loud. All right, you're getting to our major point, but one more problem about tomorrow. That's it. Tomorrow is not promised. It will, I, I've, I've got down 10,735, but I'm not guaranteed even one more, right? Um, we don't have that guarantee. So the Bible tells us not to count on tomorrow because our life is as a vapor. All we have is right now, like you said. So our time on this earth should be considered super valuable. Super valuable because we just don't know. Um, now, we're, we're going to die someday. We understand that. But here we are just blazing ahead, and we kind of fill our life full of things that overload us. I mentioned at the beginning about this you know, these predictions about how our life would get easier as time goes, but it seems like society has a way of kind of crowding it up. And I actually came across an article by a guy named Richard Swenson. He's a medical doctor, and he wrote a book in, in which he discusses the major maladies of today, our anxieties and our stresses. In fact, he called the, the book Overload, and he said people are just overloaded. Um, here's what he says, and I think I put these in your lesson, and I think it's very good, some, sort of a reminder to us about being overloaded. First of all, he says this, we are overloaded with commitments, with commitments. Um, how many of you have on your phone an app to track your commitments, whether it's work, church, or anything? How many of you have an app? Raise your hand up real high. I wanted to see who this was tonight. Yeah, some of us do. Um, and uh, the church staff has one uh, so that we can all see what's going on and, and, and not miss those commitments. Um, Y'all remember Blackberries a few years ago? That was a cool thing to have back then. Then there was voice recorders. Anybody, did anybody ever have one of those like mini cassettes or anything you could record what you had to do? I had a professor that rode around in his car and he'd pick that thing up and he'd say, uh, stop and pick up bread on the way home, you know, or whatever it was. You know, he'd remind himself of it. Then, you know, prior to that, you just had a good old notepad, right? Anybody good? So how many of you still use your good old notepad? All right. I have a notepad, and I left. I brought the wrong thing here, meaning to bring it up here tonight. I got a notepad on my desk. Um, you know, you got all these different ways. My dad has a little chalkboard in the garage where he writes down the mileage on his cars to remember the things he's got. So we got all these commitments, and we track. How did people used to do it way a long time ago? We didn't have none of that stuff. Uh, to, to help you remember, um, was there less commitments? I would say probably in part, that's probably partially true. There were less commitments. Um, man, who would get rid of these things if you could make them disappear? Um, I, I, would, I would be right there with you. I'd get rid of these things. It makes people too accessible. And therefore, it drives up your commitments. So as I was reading through what this guy had to say, I definitely agreed with his first assessment about people being overloaded with commitments. Um, we, we commit ourselves to go here and there and everywhere, take place in every activity, every social function, and we meet ourselves, as they say, coming and going, right? And as a result, some areas of our lives get undone because of our overload of commitments. Second thing he said 
is we're overloaded with possessions. I found this interesting too. I remember when we first moved out to Colorado years ago, and we were looking for a place to live, um, and all of these, you know, the lots in Colorado were not measured in acreage, okay? They were measured in square foot. Um, and so you had to learn how that translates because you didn't get an acre in Colorado unless you bought, you know, your little mini ranch or a ranch or whatever. If you're in a neighborhood, you had a square footage of, of property too that may not be much bigger than your house, but there it was. But on these little lots, all the houses seemed to be the same. They were all two, and most of them were three-story houses. So they built up instead of out. All of them were 3,000 square feet and above. <laughs> Um, and all of them were three-car garage or more. Um, and one of the booming businesses, as is, seems like every town USA now, was storage units. It always boggled my mind, because when we were looking for a place to live, I, because everybody in the whole neighborhood had to park their cars outside the garages for the stuff that was in the garages. Here it is in a place that snows nine months out of the year and they still had to park their cars outside the garages because of all the stuff they had. And then when that overflowed to a certain point, they had to take the stuff down to the storage units. And when the first storage unit got full, you had to go to the second storage unit. And when does it stop? I actually did a little study one time looking back at the average house sizes. Y'all know the houses didn't used to be very big, right? Some of you that remember back to the 40s and 50s know that there were no houses back then that crested 1,000 feet, square feet, all right, unless you were a super wealthy person. It just didn't happen, and it just kept creeping up over sign. But it's interesting. Our closets are full. Our garages are overflowing, you know. Uh, a lot of folks have gone into debt for play, uh, paying for all these things that they simply have got to have. Along comes great things like QVC, shopping channels, you know. Uh, those are, those are, and now we got Amazon. How easy is it? <sighs> How easy is it to order? Come on. Did, how many of you ordered something on Amazon today? <laughs> Look at that. <laughs> how easy is that? You know, um, our pastor's wife, Jennifer, if you're listening, um, you know, she said, it's so nice that Walmart brings my food to my house now. If I order $35 or more, are they going to bring it to my house? Well, all you got to order is a loaf of bread and, you know, a six pack of drinks and that's $35. So, man, I mean, it's so easy at the push of a button. Our lives are enriched. By that one thing, my wife has been searching for this little doodad of a thing to keep her makeup and such. And, and have you figured it out yet, Susan? Um, but you just, <laughs> I'm laughing at us because what else are we going to do? Here we are, overloaded with possessions, right? Um, how many of you tonight would say you have some stuff in a moment of honesty you don't really need? Okay. Come on, Westerners. Should we raise two hands and fall on the altar and ask for forgiveness tonight? Um, man, uh, yeah. All right, I'll move off of that because we're feeling guilty. All right, number three, we're overloaded with work. I mentioned efficiency, and I appreciate efficiency. I like having people that are efficient with things. Um, but you do know, again, when you're the efficient person in the office, you're going to get the, the work for the people that should have been doing their work too. So there's those problems that go on. But you know, you get up early, you have to fight the terrible traffic here in town. <laughs> we've actually heard a few people say, since we've lived here, complain about the traffic. And it makes us laugh, okay? We're just going to tell you that makes us laugh. <laughs> Very much so, having moved here from Pigeon Forge, um, that, that makes us laugh. Anyway, uh, you know, there's sometimes bad working conditions, and, um, you know, I, work can, man, it can run you ragged. Uh, I'm learning about, um, you know, the, the, the hours, the long hours, folks who work these chicken houses in the church and stuff, getting up, 
uh, the only thing you should be doing at four in the morning is getting ready to go deer hunting. Amen? Um, but there, there it is, you know, folks having to do what you got to do to make a living. Uh, but work can definitely overload, and that for the average American, it is a problem. Uh, and fourthly, he says there's an information overload. Now, this one I had to stop and think about for just a minute. This guy's a doctor that wrote this, and he said that he had to read 220 articles a month just to keep up with the changes that were going on as he was along in his profession. 220 articles just to stay relevant in the area of medicine. So, I didn't hear what that was. I said he's rare then if he reads to keep up. Well, probably so, probably so. But um, now we've got this super highway that thankfully Al Gore invented for us tongue-in-cheek, uh, called the Internet. Uh, you know, information pours into us all the time. And there we are. we got to have a podcast going all the time. You know, we can't... We, you know, there's not many people that can just have a quiet moment anymore. It's got you got to be watching a video of a cat, you know, or something going on all the time, soaking in the important information of the day, or ha go on Pinterest so you can learn to make some kind of, I don't know, but the information, what did we, again, what did we do before when we didn't have all this information? Wouldn't it be nice to be dumb again? I mean, was it, what, I would love that, just to simplify things again. But now because we have all of this information, we've become responsible for this information. You know, the problem is you feel like you need to know. And we feel like, we're again, we're responsible for things. As, as a pastor, I do want to keep up with what's going on locally and in the world and whatever so that I can at least be an intelligent in conversation and know and, um, and translate that perhaps into spiritual teaching. Um, but it's tough. And the problem is you can't absorb it all. There's just absolutely no way you can absorb the information that comes around these days. And it gives us that feeling of being out of touch with something. My kids <coughs> remind me time to time, graciously, and sometimes not, um, how I can be out of touch. I literally had one of, our, one of my children, I won't say which one, just a couple of days ago say, yeah, that's something even an eighth grader could do. And you remember hearing that, Susan? Um, and I thought, that's not fair. I just haven't gotten to that bit of information yet to be able to absorb it, right? But we're overloaded with information. I could go on and on, but here it is. This, these are those things. Can you believe this year is gone already? Nod your head with me. I mean, shake your head with me. Um, what are we going to do? We want to make the most of every opportunity that God gives us. And this verse qualifies the time statement by saying, because the days are evil. If we do not take our chances at combating darkness with light, who is? We got darkness locally. Our church is responsible for combating the darkness locally. And so we have to make best use of time. It's a realistic remind, reminder to us that the world is not getting better. I wish I believed in a religion system that said things are going to get better. But that's not what the Bible says. It's not. But we need to redeem the time, as the Bible says, because the days are evil. You know, years ago, I'm going to date myself here. Um, this time of year, you start hearing one of his songs play. But anybody remember Michael W. Smith? Come on now. That's some early uh, contemporary Christian. But anyway, Michael W. Smith, he, he wrote this song, and it was post um, the Columbine Massacre, if you remember that, from years ago. 
And he, the song made a statement, and he said, this is your time. This is your dance. Live every moment, leave nothing to chance. And, our, and that, that one kind of stuck with me, that line in that song. I think that's good advice. What is my best right now? It's my time. Um, how do we know? So how do we know what's best? What are we going to do? Because I, I've got the information. I know I'm frail human. I, I'm, in, I'm finite in my mind. Well, that's the third prediction for 24. Here it is. Final thing tonight. God's advice is the best advice for us this year. God's advice is the best advice for us this year. Again, I, you know, we can read stuff like this and just completely miss it, but it says, Therefore, do not be foolish. But understand what the will of the Lord is. Listen, we can learn all kind of new things we need to do through this year. How many of you have already set some New Year's resolutions? Anybody? <laughs> kind of got a little bit floating around in my mind. None of y'all? Y'all not going to do anything better? All right, here we go. So I don't know what that might be. You know, it could be something simple, change, a little change in habit. It could be a health habit. It could be a spiritual habit. I hope there are some spiritual habits mixed in there. But set some resolutions. Give yourself some targets, some goals, some things you want to do by the end of next year. But while you're doing those things, understand something. The best advice you can get is probably not going to be from great aunt so-and-so. She might have a good one. All right, listen to it, learn from it. But God's advice is the best advice for us this year. Now, I will give you a heads up. All of us are probably going to have some duh moments this year, right? We're probably all going to have some of those moments where we just, ah, that was dumb. That was dumb. But I thank the Lord for His grace, for His forgiveness, for His mercy and long-suffering, um, attitude toward human beings that tend to make mistakes. God can forgive. He can help us. And, he, and if we listen to his advice, we can avoid some major human disasters. One thing as a pastor that has always boggled me when, I, when I've had people come in for counseling is sometimes when folks leave my office, I want to hit myself on the head with a book or something. I cannot believe sometimes people come in basically looking for the pastor to say, oh yeah, that's completely okay. Go for it. Jump right in headlong and do that. That'll be great for you. When they know good and well, when they walk in my office, that is not scriptural. And I've got to tell you the truth. And I'm going to tell you the truth. That's going to ruin your life. And watch them get mad at me over that. And I always have to say, understand something. Listen, don't get mad at me. I'm simply giving you the Word of God. God's advice says don't do it. It will wreck your life just like it has other. But inevitably, folks will walk out the doors of churches and they will head right down that path that the Bible says is broad. And it heads toward what? Destruction, the Bible says. Inevitably, people are going to walk that way. Can we not? Can you guys stay out of Pastor Kevin's office this year? Okay, please. Only for good stuff, right? I hope we don't have to walk that way. We'll do what we can to help and heal if it's necessary. But here at the dawn of a new year, can we just listen to God's Word? <laughs> And let his truth be the truth we live by. So here's a couple things we're going to be done. Number one, establish priorities. Establish your priorities. First and foremost, you got these on your sheet. Make sure you make time for God. Whatever it is, if you got to erase things from your schedule, get your planner, get your app, whatever you've got to do to make sure your life is not too busy for God. How about for once we don't schedule God in, right? How about let's get back to the old-fashioned way of saying that God's stuff is first and there's the other stuff is just going to have to wait, right? You know, because it shouldn't come down to that choice on Sunday when the fishing weather is just perfect. What are we going to do? Well, there shouldn't be any choice about it, amen? God's time is first. And then we start working things in. Time for God. 
I guess we need to just simply ask ourselves a question tonight. What's most important to me in 24? What's most important to you? If you had to say, what do I spend most of my time on? And what do I put most of my energy into? What do I learn the most about through that information? What comes to the surface of your life as the most important things? Well, let's just see what those are and then just say, okay, then am I making the, the time for God that I should? Secondly, time for your family. It, it's, it's never something that shouldn't be said. And these are just some bits of advice. Every husband, husband ought to have a date night, with his, date night with his wife. I'll say it right in a minute. You know, I've kind of enjoyed most of the restaurants being over in Jonesboro. Um, for whatever reason, since we've been here, it kind of feels more like a date night when we leave here and go somewhere and do that. But, you know, when do I, when do I stop having that relationship? I don't. Just as I have that relationship with God, I've got to make those relationship times with my wife. While my children are still in the house, you have to be very intentional. And those of you who have kids at home, you know if you don't plan those things in, they ain't going to happen. The time you have to spend with your family, make sure it's there. Well, I better tack this one on because some of you are bosses here tonight. Time for your boss, all right? Yeah, make some time for your boss because you might lose your job if you don't. Make sure you're given what you should at work. Make sure you're productive, that you're doing your job. Uh, listen, nobody ought to have a bad attitude toward Christians at work. I mean, they ought to know they're getting someone responsible and honest and a person of integrity. We have a responsibility to honor the Lord in all that we do. And the Bible does mention that many, many times about giving your all. So make time for your boss. Establish your priorities. And then back to, I think, something that you mentioned right at the beginning. Learn how to live today. Learn how to just live today. Uh, the two greatest enemies I've read of time are regrets for things we did in the past and anxiety about what will happen to us in the future. Those are the two biggest areas of regret. A lot of us live in the past. Some things may be there that were really huge to us that we can't let go. And, and so we're, we're hung up by the past. A lot of us are worried about the future. And we think about that and we, and we do worry, as the Bible says, we shouldn't. I, I, I don't know if you're as guilty as I am about playing that little game of I wish. You know, how many times do you say that during a week? Man, I wish. I just wish that. What's, what's your wishes tonight? I wish that. You know, I already told you one. <laughs> I wish those would disappear. Um, I wish it was next week. I wish it were 50 years ago. Boy, I wish this day was over. How many of you said that before? I wish today was over. Um, but the Bible admonishes us to engage in today, into what God has placed you, in, into this situation right now. It is our time together. I thought this was good, and I think I do have this on the screen. Someone once said, life is what happens to you while you're making plans to do something else. Right? And that is so, so true. Life's what happens to you while you're busy making other plans. I've got, and, and there it goes. It just blows by us in a moment. Another year has, has come and it's gone. Here's this new year stretched out before us. Um... Lord, help us to redeem the time, right? I read kind of a little blessing type thing I thought was good. Um, but I think it's true. The good and the bad that God has planned for us this year that will be a part of His will and what makes us in this next year, sometimes we think are accidental. But we know God doesn't make mistakes and things aren't accidental to Him. We know that He can take all things and work them together for good. And here's what this says. During this new year, may you have enough happiness to keep you sweet, but enough trials to keep you strong. 
May you have enough sorrow to keep you human, but enough hope to keep you happy. May you have enough failure to keep you humble and enough success to keep you eager. May you have enough friends to give you comfort. May you have enough wealth to meet your needs. May you have enough enthusiasm to make you look forward to tomorrow and enough determination to make each day better than the day before. Here we are, 8,760 hours are coming our way if we make it a few more days as a gift from God. And I pray that we spend those in, in eternal ways all that we can for the benefit of His kingdom tonight. These are predictions from the Bible for next year. Let's have a word of prayer and, and we'll be dismissed tonight. And um, thank you for coming and studying with us and, um, and look for those opportunities. Engage yourself. I, I don't know of another church that does it any better, giving you opportunities to get into the Word and learn it. And so whatever those areas are, whether it's Sunday school, uh, we'll have some, uh, some life groups coming up in the new year, some new small group things going on, the D groups that some of you already, we'll have a lot of things coming your way. And I hope that you'll be engaged in those uh, as much as you can so that we can all dig deep into the Word. And uh, next, uh, this coming Sunday, uh, Lord willing, we'll have that opportunity to dig deep into Revelation, I think it is. Uh, and bringing food, right? We're bringing food, amen? That's, we're free meal, free meal Baptists, right? Uh, so bringing those things uh, again Sunday night, we'll, we'll break, break and eat. What time does that start? Is that, that still regular time Sunday night? Or is it 6 o'clock, I think, Sunday night is what that is. So I ain't got a bulletin with me, but I believe, I'm still learning you guys' times. I'm getting used to those. All right, let's have a word of prayer. God bless you. And uh, again, be friendly before you go. If you got time, I'm sure you do. Uh, Lord, thank you for your word. It challenges us. Every time we look into your word, we learn so much. Um, it's there for the gleaning and uh, help us just to soak it in. Lord, it's good to soak it in, but Lord, unless we let that become actions in our life and produce fruit, um, it's done some good, but not near what it was supposed to. So help us to do what the book of James admonishes us to do and become doers of the word and not hearers only. Help us now to put it into practice. We're probably going to be rubbing shoulders with folks that need something from us. So help us, Lord, to engage people around us as we have those opportunities. Especially this time of year, a lot of people are sad. It brings back a lot of memories and a lot of tears, heartaches. So help us to encourage and help us to be a friend to those that need it and help us to be a witness of, for the God who loves them and wants to have that relationship with them. Bless us through the remainder of this week and we look forward to coming back together at the end of the week and re-engaging together as brothers and sisters in Christ in this great church. We love you. Thank you for the blessings of being a Christian. And we pray it in Jesus' name for His sake, His kingdom's sake. Amen. Amen. God bless you. Y'all have a good evening.